right, hello, smiling faces, welcome, welcome. Uh, my name is Mark Gerwitz. We're going to talk today about AGML, which is an analog game design modeling language. Now, um, yeah, so a couple things before we get started. Um, yeah, we got Andy and Lucas uh, running the show here, so uh, Lucas is going to be managing the chat. Um, he's the one in, in managing all your questions. Please feel free to post questions as we go. He will relay them to me somehow and uh, I'll do my best to answer them in a way that makes sense within the flow. So please feel free to do that. Um, I'm yeah, I am interested in your ideas, thoughts, questions, concerns, perspectives, whatever you want to add as we go is fantastic. Uh, what else? We're going to use, so we got the split screen going here. What we're going to do is we're going to use, um, we're going to, going to do all of what we talk about today in the, the tool I've got going. Uh, there are other ways to do this. You can do it on paper. I have a PowerPoint, but I, you know, you don't want to do a PowerPoint. We actually want to do this. So we're going to use this live tool and we'll just design live. The other thing we're going to mention is I, a couple quick points. I know that I talk fairly quickly. That's just a habit of mine. So if at any point it's going too fast, reach out to Lucas um, or reach out to the chat, sorry. And, and Lucas will tell me to slow down. That's fine. I'm totally fine with this. So if you need me to repeat something or cover a concept again, or you're, something's a bit odd or different, or you have an interesting sort of something I missed or I went too fast for it, again, feel free to, to reach out on that one and just say, hey, Mark, slow it down or repeat that thing. Totally fine. Uh, so that's it. So we're going to talk a little bit about HTML. We're going to talk about how and why and what we're doing. And I'll do some demos and examples. We'll have questions from all of you, hopefully, some insights. And that'll be it. Well, in an hour, we'll wrap it up. Um, if there are questions before we begin, like I said, throw them in the chat and uh, we'll get started. So, um, yeah, so what we're using is I'm <clears throat> to start with this tool here is actually based on another modeling tool. Uh, there's a fairly popular online uh, tool called, uh, it used to be called draw.io and is now called diagrams.net, which you may or may not be familiar with. It was, it's a, it's a, an open source modeling tool based on another open source graphing tool. And, um, basically I modified it to work with AGML. So that's what we're going to be using. Uh, I needed some tool to use. There are lots of tools out there, but in the space of making it accessible and available for everyone, this was the tool I went with. So we're just going to model straight in it. I'm also going to use it as a bit of a whiteboard space. So I don't need to have a second app open to flip back and forth. If I want to make a note or draw something on the screen, we'll just use this. So uh, let's go ahead and, and do this and talk about it. So what is AGML? <clears throat> and basically, it started with uh, I, well, the problem. And the problem to me is that in game design, we're still at a space where we're, we as a design community, uh, and I'm and, and, you know, they're using that term very, very openly, very, you know, very broadly, uh, are still in a space where we're trying to figure out how best to communicate our ideas to other designers, other people on our team, other developers, publishers maybe, um, in a classroom with students and teachers, uh, if I'm working collaboratively with another designer, how best to sort of share ideas and, and get them across. And there have been, you know, an, an example of this that you may have seen, it comes up every couple of months on, uh, on a number of social media platforms where someone will say there's, uh, you know, do we use the word round and then turn and then or is it phase and then round and then turn or and and we sort of you know we sort of try to get into we get a little bit into the weeds sometimes about the exact language and i kind of sidestepped that but it said maybe there's a way to, to to model something that that anyone can use that will help us visualize our our game designs from a high level point of view and, and just help us discuss and look at our, our general flow and our general um game logic. So that's basically what the attempt was here. I've, I have, uh, you know, I, I, well, you don't know, so I'm saying, you know, I'm saying, you know, is that uh, passing phrase we use to fill time, you know, uh, but I, so I teach uh, UML modeling and I have uh, familiarity and comfortable comfort with flow charting. And I said, maybe there's somewhere here I can use some of my experience to uh, find a middle ground that will give us something that we can model with. So Basically, that's how the, you know, the HTML was born. And it uses, it, it does use things from those languages, but it's not those languages. So don't feel like if you don't know what flowcharting is, you're in trouble. That is not the case. You don't have to know a thing before you show up today. 
I'm happy that you, you're here. Fantastic. You don't have to know anything more than you're here and you're and you're interested. That's great. If you do know uh, flowcharting or UML, you may see some familiar things. Okay, great. Uh, that 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 doesn't hurt. You know, the more familiarity we have jumping into a concept, uh, the easier it's going to be. So basically, I mean, what I'm going to do is we'll, we'll discuss a little bit about how and why this is used. I'll show you how you model, and then we can see how that might be applicable to things. So uh, this modeling tool, like I said, it, it's just a, it's a really nice little graphing tool. It's got lots of customization options, lots of you know, putting text on screen, the text in the space. And it's designed to handle a number of different icons. These are all reasonably custom for, uh, for HTML. So starting from the simple spot, if you wanted to make a game and you wanted to model a game, you, the, the most common icon here is this oval, this ellipse. And the ellipse, uh, when you roll over it, it says it's a player action, and that's what it's called. Okay, so the player action lets you say, well, what does a player do on their turn? So um, let's try this. We're going to try this with a more complex game. So go ahead and throw in the chat any game name you think that you think most people are familiar with. Don't name some obscure thing that no one's played in 10 years. And don't give me your favorite game that no one knows. Just anything you can think that, hey, there's a room of 10 to 15 people here, I think. I think that's our numbers. And, uh, you know, what do you think most people here have heard of and played that's reasonably common that, that I've heard of because I'm not modeling something I don't know? Uh, so... Go ahead and throw that in the chat. Uh, hopefully, Lucas will. I'm sure Lucas will give me the uh, the list, and we can go from there. While you're doing that, I'm gonna pick a game. So I'll give you a few minutes to do that. There's no rush. Just list a game. Uh, I'm gonna pick the easiest game I've ever been able to think of when I was modeling this, uh, or when I've been playing with the models. And the easiest game I can think of is Candyland. Okay, there isn't it. The, not a, not a not a slight to Candyland. It's a fine game for its target market. And it works well in many situations. Um, but it, as far as the game flow, it's relatively simple. So Candyland, this process, this oval, indicates what you would do on your turn. So in Candyland, on your turn, you, I'm just going to see if it'll set fonts here. On, uh, did it, Well, maybe I'll set it afterwards. On your turn, in Candyland, you draw a card and you play a card. Oops. Okay, you get to hear me tap and typing. Uh, I'm going to just adjust font sizes. I did not realize the software was going to. Uh, and again, if anything's not vi uh, visible on the screen, if it's too small, I should have mentioned that. I'm sorry. If it's too small, the font or illegible or some other issue, again, let me know, and I will, um, I will adjust that. Oh, that didn't work. There we are. Okay. So on Candyland, the player action is to draw a card and play a card. That's basically all you do. On your turn. You draw a card and you play a card. There isn't a ton of direct player interaction. There isn't a ton of anything else to think about. That's your action. Now, using Candyland, this, 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 you could probably model Candyland with basically this, and I think most people would sort of understand it. It doesn't give you a very full picture, but again, it's a fairly simple game. The, the net, but there is something you want to do in Candyland, and obviously this is my turn. But at some point, it needs to become your turn or the next player's turn. So there is an icon that is used for this. Now, one of the things we're going to use throughout, the, throughout this modeling uh, to, uh, system is we're going to have a series of icons, which I'll show you, and we're going to connect those icons with arrows. Okay, it's called the directional connector. That's because I probably didn't change the text that came with uh, whatever, just an arrow or a connector. Um, that, there's a curved one you can use. I usually use the straight one, just easier. So... This thing here, you can take this connector and attach it to anywhere. It all links up and attaches nicely in the software. And I can say, now what? So I draw a card and play a card. And now what? What comes next? The next thing that happens, actually, is that it's the next player's turn. The next player's turn, there is a specific tool. Uh, sort of, it's, it's a kind of a different version of an icon, but it is, it's what I use here. And it's a past turn. And it's this kind of twist. And it says, okay. We, it's one person's turn, okay, and we then pass the turn to another player, okay, so we say, um, draw a card and play a card, and then this icon here, this twist says it's another player's turn, okay, typically in player order, this, 
We're not going to get into the depths of which order is the best way to play, but we, we draw a card and we play a card and we pass to the next player. And this is basically Candyland. There isn't really much else to it. You can do this all day until someone reaches the end of the game. There is a little bit there for reaching the end of the game, but we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, if there's any questions about this, if anyone's looking going, okay, whoa, I already have a question mark. This is already something I need to know more about, or there's other confusions. Again, please feel free to post them so that uh, I can see them and I can answer them. Okay. Apocalypse World, I don't know. Eclipse. Oh, uh, I haven't played Eclipse in so long. It would be unfair of me to try to model it. And go. Uh, I'm going to leave go off. We you know what? We'll do something simpler. We'll do a relatively simple, straightforward. Uh, you know what? We'll do a. We'll do something else. Um, okay. So let's 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 ramp up the difficulty here a little bit. Let's look at. I'm going to do Forbidden Island. Okay, Forbidden Island. We can mop, mop, model that one again. Most people have seen that or played that. I'm sure. Um, So for Forbidden Island, uh, again, I usually start with a step, but it doesn't have to be what the player action is. You can think, what does a player do on their turn? And on their turn in Forbidden Island, you can uh, shore up. You can shore up a space. Okay, that's a fairly common action you can do. You can. Um, you can give a card to a player. I'm going to try to remember this off the top of my head. It's been a little while since I played Forbidden Island. Um, you can shore up a land, you can give a card to another player, you can, uh, you can get the treasure, get a treasure, I believe is treasure, if I spell it correctly, it'll make a lot more sense, okay, and you can, uh, someone's going to correct me what I've missed, you can move, of course, you can move, yeah. if I've missed one again, just feel free to correct me. Now, this is four actions you can do on your turn, but you don't do them all. You do a sum of these. You can do one, two, or three of these actions, and there's four of them. So how do you differentiate that? So what there is is there's an icon here, uh, the choice symbol. And the choice symbol, you drop that in, and that says that you can... Um, Kevin, that's a great question. I'll come back to that in a minute. So in the choice symbol, it says that you can now choose multiple things to do on, on your turn. Okay? So I can choose to... Uh, this is not, they're all sort of, we're, we're relying on the software to make our lines for us, which, there you go, that's a little better. So on my turn, I have a choice of any of these four actions. And so now I can say, hey, I want to complete one of these, uh, one of, oops, sorry, let's see if I link that correctly. Doesn't really matter. Yeah, it's close enough. You can all see what it's doing. So now on my turn, I can execute any of these actions. This icon here of this pie slice says I can choose, I can choose actions. So uh, it's, um, yeah, so I can choose any of these four actions to do. Now, uh, so that's, that's the start to Forbidden Island. And then we wanna add a little bit to Forbidden Island. Uh, so we might say Forbidden Island that let's, 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 we're gonna grow this out a little bit. So these are the four main actions you do. After you're done taking an action, Okay, you're going to, uh, sorry, we're going to, we're going to need a turn player at some point, a switch turn player, so I'll put it over there. And after I'm done taking my action, I'm going to say I'm just going to connect all my lines back to here. All right, move that out of the way a little bit. Okay, there might be more. We can always modify and add new, uh, new things if we need to. Okay, there are some questions here. Werewolf, okay. Werewolf would be interesting as well. So there is a little bit, the, one of the things that this doesn't do extremely well as a modeling tool, and I'm, I admit this, is that it's not the best, uh, in fact, I don't think it's a great tool for modeling social interactions. If you wanted to say, hey, let's, you know, and werewolf or resistance, if you want, <clears throat> excuse me, want to say, hey, let's determine you know, argue about who the, the traitor is, or, you know, that's not, that isn't going to fit here very well because you can't tell people how to socially interact very well. I don't think you can do that very well in a, in a technical model, um, but, it, but we can try and model that. Okay, so, and don't worry, Kevin, I haven't forgotten your question. So, <clears throat> uh, so where are we at? So we do this, and then we pass to the next player. So we say, okay, well, I've done all that, and now it's the next player's turn. Now, Let's add a little bit more to this. Firstly, as we know, as I just mentioned from Forbidden Island, is that there are four actions, but you can't do them all. 
and you can do any one of them maybe multiple times. So what you can do is you can modify these uh, symbols like this one, and I can put, for example, in here, one to three, and I can say you can do one to three actions, your choice of these. So I get a little overview that I don't have to necessarily, you know, I can immediately see that I can say, okay, I can choose uh, one, two, or three actions. You usually do all three, but fair enough, you don't have to. And I can choose to do the give a card twice, for example, those sharp ones. So I have a little bit of control over how that works. And that's how that works. Okay, then uh, there's a couple other icons here we can add while we're talking about new icons. There's this square, this rectangle. The rectangle is an automated process. And this is something that, <clears throat> excuse me, Sorry, one second. Oh, there we go. This is something that <clears throat> takes place um, automated by the, by the game that is not specifically player driven. It's usually used for a setup <clears throat> or something that is automatic. So we might say that uh, an automated process could be setup. Setup is really common. Okay, so there's a setup that happens in your game somewhere. We might also have, and I'll come back to the setup in a minute, <clears throat> the phase where we draw cards from the flood deck. Okay. And we draw three cards from the flood deck. And that happens actually over here. And all of my lines have to be readjusted a little bit. If I can do this without the software looking, thinking I've totally mucked it up. There we go. Okay, and so actually at the end of your turn, you're drawing three cards from the flood deck, and and then after that happens, we then take we then flip to the next player. And I've used draw three from the flood deck as an automated process. Now, this doesn't have to be automated process. It could be you could argue that it's a player process. In my mind, it doesn't really matter because this is not anything that the player really has much say in. It's you. You don't. You could technically just have a little robot sit there and flip three cards, and it it would still work exactly the same way. So <clears throat> that's why I, I envision it as a square. But here's the thing about this, which comes back to Kevin's early question, is that this is up to you as the designer and the developer to determine how you want to model. If you want to say that Candyland is two steps, okay, draw a card. I'm going back to Candyland for a moment here, okay, and play a card. Okay, and you want to say, no, I think this is two separate steps in my game, and that's how I see it. Then you know what? That's great. Cool. Good for you. I haven't got the designer of Candyland here to, to, to have this discussion with, so I went with how I see it. But if you say, you know what? I think those are two separate steps. Cool. Go for it. To me, in Candyland, the drawing of the card and the playing of the card are immediately followed with no decision or differentiation. So I don't, so that's why I lumped them together, Kevin. But it's a great question. And you could certainly say, look, in my game, drawing a card means draw four and keep one. And that's a different process from playing a card where you can look at your hand and you have a decision to make. Candyland doesn't have that. You pick up the card and you play the same card you picked up. So that's why I had them lumped together. But again, this is up to you as a designer. My intent here is to give you design space, but you can do it how in a way that you feel comfortable with that you like. You do not have, there's no strict rules about this must be done exactly this way. Uh, I, don't want, I don't want that to be the case. I want this to be something that designers can use in a way they find comfortable with. If you say, I want to write more text in this block, go for it. Okay, go for it. If you want to number these, I think that's an interesting idea. If you're sharing game ideas with someone else and you want to include numbers, that would be a neat way to sort of track things you know let's look at action number two when everyone knows what you're talking about okay so that could be a thing here you could include as well um that's up to you uh okay so setting up the game set up the game is again it's not really part of the game but it's it's not part of the game the game sort of central flow but it is part of the game uh design so i would include set, a setup here for example i could uh easily just say let's just jump into the game there we go we set it up first player does this thing uh, the other icons we're going to add to this while we're here is we're going to add these these two semicircles, the start game and the end game. Okay, uh, the start game, or sometimes I think of it as the sunrise. That just says when your when your when your logic starts. Okay, this is so that if someone's coming into your diagram for the first time ever, they can immediately see that this is where where I should start reading. Because this diagram as a whole, if I showed you this like this. 
Okay, you might sort of look and say, okay, wait a minute, what am I, what am I looking at first here? Where, where, is, where am I going? Whereas with this start space, and this, you don't need to do anything here. You don't have to say start. It just means start. There's nothing to do. Okay, um, and in starting a space, you, you can say, this is just a start, so this way anyone who's looking at it goes, oh, okay, I start here, and we go straight into setup, and then we go from there. So that's really what this is. And there's nothing more to it. It just says this is the start of the, of the flow. Which means it's, it is followed with an end game, okay, which I sometimes think of the smiley face. And the smiley face, at some point we have to say this game is over. It does have to end. I did not include this in Candyland. It was just to get us started. But let's put it in this one. I think we can put it here. At some point, the game has to end, which is going to be an interesting sort of secondary thought here. I'm going to scroll down just a bit to give us a little more space, okay? Uh, we draw three from the flood deck. Now, at some point, this game ends in a couple of ways, which I'm going to try to remember all of them. One way the game can end is if the flood, if the island, if the water meter goes too high, then the whole island is flooded, everyone dies. If the uh, escape pad floods, uh, the whole line, in, people can't leave, therefore the game ends. If the, this is going to be, <laughs> this is going to be fun to model this part now that I think about it. If the, um, all the players die, I, I guess that's possible, or they get stranded and they can't swim or can't move, I guess that's possible, you could, you could just time out that way. Uh, or ideally, everyone makes it back to the helipad and you have the correct card to get off the island. So let's see how that would look. So how do we, how would we include that here? I'm going to just move things, I'm going to move things over just a little bit to just give myself a little bit more working space because this is, okay, let's, well, oh, shoot, getting a little hard to fit everything in. Okay, so <clears throat> we draw three from the flood deck. At some point, we have to check if someone's won. And to do that kind of thing, we can use a decision. And a decision basically says, is something true or false? Is something happening or not happening? Okay, and we can say, has this happened? So, for example, we can say here, some people like to write in the, di in the diamond. Um, traditional flow charting says you kind of write beside it. it, it it's really up to you. Um, so I'm going to say, for example, uh, on a helipad with card. Okay. I'm not going to get into the depth of that. Again, this isn't, this isn't to replace rule sets. This isn't going to replace the the text of the game, it's just to understand the flow. So I think that's probably okay. Are we on the helipad with the card? And then we have, out of the decision, we have two directions we can go in. Uh, I prefer looking like this, it'll fit better. We have an arrow for yes and an arrow for no. Okay, so I'm gonna say yes and no. So let's just say we said, uh, actually either way it's an end game. Uh, either way the game ends, now that I think about it but we might be able to declare we won or something if we want. I don't think there's much to it. Um, this here. There's not much to say we won. We won, um, and we might say we won, and then after we win, we end the game. There's nothing much else there. We could put one in for lose if we want as well. We throw a little bit of text over here. So what you do is typically with this, you'll sort of say which one's the yes way out and which one's the no. Okay, now for an end game, I mean, I usually don't model all the wins and loses as separate processes because it isn't really anything. It's just, hey, we won and the game's over, or we lost and the game's over. So either way to me, that's, are we on the helipad with the card? And so this is one way to look at it. The other way I would look at it is, uh, yes, we are, oops, sorry, yes, we are there or no, we're not. And if we're not, then it's the next player's turn, which actually means that what we end up with is this. If this makes some sense. So we um, actually on the heli. Oh, now I'm sorry. Bear, bear with me. I'm now thinking uh, forbidden island on the helipad with the card actually happens on a person's turn. Doesn't really happen after you draw three from the flood deck. Okay. Uh, I'll show you how we can handle this in a minute. I will show you how we can handle this in a minute. Um, but this is what the decisions are used for. So you can say, I've got this decision we've got to make. And is it something true? Yes, we've ended the game or not. Okay, go to the next player. I will show you how we can handle on the helipad with the card uh, now. 
Uh, do we have a few questions from yeah, chat? I do have some questions here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna get to them. So, um, so there is so um, for the Zoe or Zoe. I apologize if I'm getting names right. I'm just reading on screens here, so I totally apologize. I guessed Kevin because it says Kevin's name twice. Maybe Zoe. Um, I'm. You probably have to have a segment that's argue or come to terms. So there is still. This is really early as far as I'm concerned. I have had some feedback from some other designers already with you know maybe some kind of icon to denote this or something else to handle that, and that's a great idea. Some way to say, hey, let you know, talk as players. Um, that might be an option. I'll look into it. I think it's a good idea. I've also got someone who said, well, how do you repeat things if you want to say, I want to, you know, get three treasures? How do you indicate that? Um, those are things I'm still looking at. And thank you for sharing that. That's great. Um, we also have a question asking about yeah. is there a symbolic difference between must do a step versus may do a step, the optional side? Okay. So there is an optional step. That's a good question. So if you wanted to say something is optional, you could include a dotted line and the dotted line says it's optional okay so you take a line and you can either make it dotted or you can add uh this software lets you make it dotted or you can just add it in from here from the tool and the dotted line says this is an optional step okay now this makes it a little iffy here we have one to three of required steps are they all optional that's up to you as a designer but it is possible thanks that's a good question thank you for that. whoever asked it that's a good question yeah um, that was a good sign uh, we, I also have a question with what happens when turns are simultaneous or not necessarily like based on one thing ending to start the next when they're more freeform. That is gonna, that's going to lead directly into my next, my next, uh, my next point. So whoever said that, you're reading my mind. Psychic abilities, I love it. Let's go. Uh, and uh, it's like you could draw card player specific. If you could, right, okay. So yeah, someone sort of commented a bit there about drawing and playing a card. Uh, which I think I've already covered. Okay, so how would we handle something with a little bit more complexity in terms of the players and how they work? So what I've also included here are what I call domains. And I've made two different ones just because the software it works better in the software. And if someone's a great JavaScript developer and wants to help me work on some things here, I would appreciate it because I'm fine with th these icons and I ran into a little bit of difficulty on some of the depth of this software. Anyways, let's look at another game. Uh, let's do... Uh, Let's do code names because code names. I'm using ones from my PowerPoint example because I'm more. I've already looked at them once or twice, but this is actually very. We could use werewolf. Actually, let's do werewolf uh, because someone mentioned it. So let's go with games you mentioned. Why do we have to go with games I mentioned? Let's do games you mentioned. Okay. So uh, oh, I don't do that because if I do this, everything gets bigger. Okay, leave the font size. Forget it. You can read it. Okay. So in werewolf, let's leave the uh, the 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 DM the the. the the GM DM out of it because they're not really part of the game. They're just making sure people take their turns. In Werewolf, we do get sort of uh, simultaneous player action and you also have individual player action. So what you can do in games where you have multiple people doing a thing at once, okay? You all, you have these, these three icons here and you have these two domains, which are again, exactly the same, but just sized differently to fit better on a screen because the large one comes in bigger and the small one comes in smaller. It's just a matter of which one fits your, your game process better. What you can do is you can say in Werewolf, for example, that we have all the players, okay, simultaneous. So let's, I'm, I'm using a whole lot of new icons here at once. I'm going to try to cover them all. The domain says all the things that happen here belong to or are taken by some specific player or players. Um, I did not use this for uh, Forbidden Island or Candyland because it's, they're, they have a tr very traditional turn structure where on your turn you do a bunch of things and the other players aren't necessarily as involved. Although, yes, in Forbidden Island you can give cards to another player. They're not, strictly speaking, involved in that process. But a lot of games don't have that. That's either simultaneous play, as someone mentioned, or there's multiple people doing things on your turn or all kinds of different flexibilities there. So what we've got is a domain that says, look, all the players, and this is, this, so there's three different, like, there's two to start. There's the player and all the players. And this is, so you can say the current player on their turn does all of these things. Sorry, one second here, I used the wrong domain. So it, the domain lets us set aside an area of things. So we could say that the current player does all of these things. Okay, everything in this box on the left. And all the players can do all the things in this box on the right. And so that way we could say, for example, all the players in something like Werewolf could debate, which is a bit old, but it might fill that space for, how do you say, argue or come to terms, right? Maybe we just say, that's it. They just debate. 
okay? And they uh, choose uh, choose to uh, remove. We remove a player from the game, okay? By whatever terms, again, werewolf, mafia, whatever you want to call it. Okay, they choose to, they, they debate, and then they choose to remove. And this is not some, this is vote-driven, typically, I believe. I haven't played werewolf in a heck of a long time. Um, but uh, there, and that's not optional either. The software tends to remember the, the last thing you did. Uh, go back. Okay. So we were, as a team, we debate and choose to remove, but individually, there may be something we do as well. Okay. Now, this you can say, for example, here, it's, it's, actually, it's actually exactly the same because Werewolf has sort of the, now that I think about it, it's got a very similar kind of loop depending on who you are. And we might even say this, this single player, hold on a second, let's just bring it to the front. This single player, we could either, it didn't work, okay. This single player, we can either say is, it, again, it depends a little bit on how you choose to model this. You could say this is the werewolf, okay? Uh, this is the werewolf character. I realize that werewolf has more than one, okay? But they're making a unified decision. So it, we might say that's actually one. You could also say it's two, if that's the way you feel better about modeling. Again, it's your model. Um, we could say that's the werewolf. And the werewolf on their sort of night phase is choosing to debate and choose to remove. And then the other players on their face choose to debate and choose to remove. I mean, werewolf's fairly straightforward, I think. Uh, I'm not sure I'm missing anything there. Uh, there's, and then there's some end game condition where you would check and say something like, uh, you know, um, all player, uh, so player's dead or werewolf's dead. Okay, I mean, there's much else to it. I think someone's going to correct me. This doesn't handle all the rules, and I'll cover all the rules about werewolf in a minute. Actually, we'll talk about that. And then you can say the game's over. It depends. Again, this really depends on you. You may say that this 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 modeling end game thing is redundant for werewolf. That's not the interesting part. The interesting part is the the the, the two phases. Uh, you may want to be really, really in-depth about this. Some people want that level of sort of um, uh, super, sort of super control where you can say that I want... Uh, why is this not going to the back? There we are. Or I want to say that I actually want to really indicate that after we choose to remove, they debate. And after they choose to remove, we go back to, you know, the other team debate. And we go back and forth until, uh, until someone's dead, Okay. We could be this pedantic, or we could say, no, you know what, I don't, that doesn't matter. The overall idea is that one team does a thing, another team does another thing. And you can use this kind of model for something like code names as well, where you have the clue giver and the rest of the team. And the clue giver on one side um, says, here's the clue, and the rest of the team debates, discusses, and chooses uh, X number of matching cards. So that's how you might handle that, which actually also brings us right back to... Uh, the helipad, how you might handle the helipad, or maybe not the helipad, but the flooding. You could also use the one thing. Now, I didn't, again, I didn't domain this because it, it's everything on video one person's turn. It didn't feel necessary. It really depends on how you want to model. But what you can include is, I would, what I might consider here is a separate domain with this little timer. And the timer is for non sequential things to happen. Oops. So I could say that. Uh, as a, I'm going to include something that, that I don't really care when it happens, but, you know, if you wanted to say that um, flood marker, I'm not sure you can do this in, I'm not sure it's actually possible to do this outside of someone's turn in Forbidden Island, I can't remember, um, but flood marker is at top, okay? Let's say you just want to say the flood marker is at the top, and I don't care when this happens. If at any point in the game the flood marker is at the top, then we can say that ends the game. Okay, that is possible to do it that way as well. All right, and this is something that just says, hey, you know, it's not my turn. It doesn't matter when. It's just an ongoing sequential check of when something is happening. So that lets you have sort of off-turn or outside-of-turn uh, events or checkings happening. It's often used to check events, but it doesn't have to be. You could say that every, uh, if it's, Escape, Curse of the Temple, is 10 minutes time up, all right? Or, or even Escape also has, uh, now that I think about it, it has other timings that happen occasionally. So after seven minutes, this event happens or something. So it is possible to add all kinds of stuff here, depending on your game flow. Um, okay, so 
Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, can you remind me of the last question there? The last question was asking about simultaneous turns. Oh, okay. We kind there of is, yeah, yeah, which we just covered. Okay. There is a note of so one person suggests. Uh, looks like I'm Kevin. Kevin suggested Apocalypse World. Apocalypse World is a role playing game, and so that very much has a switch between free form where anyone can say something and these back and forth elements of combat for example where there is a structure and how you move between those where there's triggers or decisions that m t decide when things happen okay uh great thank you kevin and thanks for the question um so uh, yeah i'm not familiar with apocalypse world so that's kind of why i had to move past that one so this so there are some uh some some limits to what this will do i'm not i don't think this is going to solve every problem and i don't think it's intended to it is not, it would, there, let me, let's talk a little bit about the limits of this modeling tool, because I, I have no problem mentioning that it's not, you know, I realize it's not perfect. Um, firstly, I'm not sure how well it would work for a typical role-playing experience, okay? Role-playing experiences are super driven by the players, as they should be. They're driven by the story developing in certain ways. And, I mean, maybe if you were designing the experience, you're the DM, or you were the designer saying, look, I really want this to sort of have a specific structure. Yeah, maybe like I played the Pathfinder board game, which I know is not a role playing game. Um, you might say that there's some way we want to incorporate that. But if it was what I think of as traditional role playing structure, irrespective of the, the actual uh, tool you use, that is that's just the DM does something or says something and then the players take do something. You know, it's so just it's so many decisions that the players can make. You would end up with. A decision tree here with your pie slice and you'd end up with 55 different possible things you could do and i think at that point the model would probably just collapse on itself or something i don't think it would be the ideal uh tool for role play modeling for role playing games to model now if you had a thing like the apocalypse world which again i'm not familiar with but if you're saying there's some phase in the game that was regimented or structured yeah you could certainly use this for part of that and say look the rest of the game is explained uh, you know, through this 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 style of play or this structure, or if someone has ideas on how you would imply that apply not imply apply that I'm sorry how you would apply that, I'd be happy to to look into that. Uh, this isn't. It also doesn't handle another thing that I want to mention that it isn't it isn't particularly ideal at is if you had a game, uh, and I'm terraforming Mars or Magic the Gathering where you have a hundred different cards and they all do different things. Okay, or Magic the Gathering's 8 million cards who all do 8 million different things. There isn't really an ideal way to model that here because, again, I mean, you could. If you really want to, I'd love to see it. But, I mean, I think at that point you're, 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 you're including every single class, every single card as a separate item of some sort. And I think the, this is the wrong, I think this is the wrong tool. I think at that point, maybe I, I would, if it was me, well, I considered that for one of my games. And it became a it became a class diagram, frankly, which I don't really want to get into here, and it's not what this is. Um, so there are some limits, and I think some of these some of the games that have more uh, heavily heavily driven player interactions are going to have a little bit of a harder time seeing how because like, you, you can't dictate what someone does. I mean, you can you can't dictate how someone thinks. Let's put it that way. So if I have a choice on who to give the card to, we can't say that here. Give a card to player of your choice. Okay, I'll, you know, fine, but that doesn't that doesn't tell me, you know, how that choice is getting made. Uh, I saw someone yesterday who said that, you know, in, they don't like games where you, you they don't mind play interaction, but when you're sort of uh, what's what I'm looking for taking revenge on them for a previous action, they don't like that. And that may be, you know, that's fine, but there's no way to include that in the model because that is that's a human decision, and you can't really say, you know, take an action that isn't gonna that is not a vengeful action. I don't know. It, it seems like it seems like a, it seems at that point that I'm try, as a designer, I would be trying to over control the game, and I don't think role playing games work that way. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, definitely. Okay. There is a point that you talked to a bit before about abstraction. Almost, you know, do you say it's two steps to draw a card and play a card, or yeah. one step because it yeah. changed together? Where, how do you kind of handle? And it's not a, you're not looking at every single action, but rather the structure of something. So in Magic the Gathering, you can't put every card in here, but there is a structure to how a turn works, how they flow, or sometimes in games like role-playing games, the the role-play side is freeform, but the actual combat has a very specific structure that you choose to put things in. Yeah. So how do you kind of abstract those things? Or like at what point is it a good turn time to move away from the tool? 
as opposed to using it more generally? Okay. Uh, that's a great question. So the, I, I mean, the tool, again, it's designer dependent, okay? So you may say as a designer, I'm going to do a high level model of Magic the Gathering. And a high level, I, I, it has been, I can't, it's not fair of me to model Magic because I haven't played it in so long that they changed the rules on me when I wasn't looking. So I cannot model what Magic look like, looks like anymore. But you could take a very high level view of Magic and say, uh, if I remember off the top of my head, you would um, you draw cards. Someone's going to correct me. You draw a card, typical. I mean, and, and magic, magic. You know, when I used to teach Magic: The Gathering, I always said, "Here's the game, and just be aware there's a card that will break every single rule I tell you." So just, you know, that just learn. That's just how it is. That's just lesson number one with Magic. Um, and then you, Magic has all the different phases, okay? And and so they they broke. They use domains. They basically use phases as domains. And phase one, you. It's the pre-step and the post-step, and I forgot. No, thank you very much for sharing. Beginning, pre-combat, combat. It's been ages and ages. When I played, there were no fa- it was, it was the, it was not called phases. Um, anyways, so you could say, you know what? It's it's combat phase, and it's just combat, and there isn't anything else to it. And I want to model a high-level model where I just say do combat, or I could say choose attackers, and I could make a lower-level model. It's really up to me and how I want to share my model with other people, okay? If I'm doing this for myself internally, I might say, you know, let me start with a high-level model, and later, um, and then, you know, uh, we have choose defenders for my opponent, which uh, choose defenders, and that would probably need a separate domain. And uh, put that there. I'm modeling everything just in whiteboard space, obviously, okay? And I could say text something like opponent. Okay, and I can say this is the opponent domain. I know I've done this two different ways. You can do it two different ways. This is your space. So you can say this is the opponent design. And in the opponent, they choose their defenders. So you could say that I want to go really low level and break this out. You could say I want a high level view. It, again, if you're working with someone else, you might start with a high level view and then break out certain parts. You might say in the role playing game, obviously the rest of it I'm not going to model, but the combat I want to I want to drill down. It's really up to you. There isn't. I don't want to tell you how to model because I don't think that helps. Um, I think it's more useful for you to say, look, this is the this is the part where I say, you know, play a card and take the action on the card, and I'm not going to model every single thing that card could do. I, I, it would be it would be exhausting. I think it would be, and I think it would be counterintuitive, and I think your model would become so heavy it would be useless. That's my opinion. I, I, maybe you do it, and I'd love to see it. So I could be wrong. I hope that answers the question. We have another question. Yeah, it definitely okay. does. We have another question from Craig Maloney asking, yeah. how do you, so we've given several, you've given several examples of how games are, pre-existing games are made. But right. if you're currently designing a game using this to help develop, how do you start? Can you give like a, a show how you would start developing with this tool? Okay, so a couple of ways, you can, a couple of things you can think about. Now, so one of the, okay, one of the issues with this tool is it's not, I'm not, Total. I mean, I, I made it, and I said, here's a thing, and I shared it with people, and they said, that's a cool thing, keep sharing it. So that's kind of where we are. Um, I suspect that this is more of a collaborative and analysis tool than a straight-up design tool. And I, and I, and I say this with a, lo- a little bit of hesitancy, but having put a lot of thought into it. In software design or electrical engineering or a whole bunch of other fields or architecture for that matter. We start with the design because developing the thing from the ground up without a design is, is prohibitively, prohibitively cost uh, expensive. That doesn't make sense. Okay. Uh, it's prohibitively not cost effective. Ugh, speaking weirdly. Okay. Uh, it's expensive. It's time consuming. So it makes much more sense to start with the paper model or digital model, and say, let me let me think this out first, because building it is, it, you, you, if you built a building without uh, a proper um, blueprint, it would likely fall down. And then you'd have to start again. And so the cost and time to do it is not worth it. It's much more effective to start with a model. And, and that's used in dozens of different fields. The thing about game design, which was which was pointed, which was mentioned by uh, by Sen when we were talking about this once. He said, and he and he put it really uh, eloquently. He said, game design isn't really a hard science. It's somewhere between art and science. And oh, sorry, Sen Feng Lim, full name. Um, and the it, and I think that's true. 
And I think a lot of designers, you know, we a lot of designers build from either some kind of instinct or a feeling you want the game to have. I want people to feel that they're having a complicated negotiation with other players for a limited set of resources or whatever, like whatever the, the, the feel you want out of the game is. And it's very hard to say, now, how does that become a model? And I'm not so... And I know that the number one th advice that most designers give to new designers is just start doing it. Just cut pieces of paper or grab a die and just make something. Even if it's garbage, at least you're going to iterate faster. And so the thing about game design is because it's, again, compared to software design or compared to um, engineering or electrical or car manufacture or anything else, is that you can iterate very quickly for very cheaply. Okay, you can build the game, try it at your desk and go, this doesn't work, and then throw it out and do another one. And it took you half an hour, and it would take even longer than that just to get started on a model. So it's probably better as an analysis collaborative tool. And that's where I see this fitting a bit better. So it's more likely to be something I know it seems may, may be a bit redundant, and that's okay, uh, where you build it, and you've got your game, or you've got your prototype of your game, and then you sort of say, let me model this, so that now if I'm sharing it with someone else, I'm sending them an email to explain my game, I don't have to send, I mean, I still have to send a few paragraphs of text, but those paragraphs will make sense in context. Because that's one thing I noticed when I was, I was collaborating with another designer at one point, and we were sending emails back and forth. That, and I know it's email, and there's a lot of better ways to share than email, but it was just reams of text. And we didn't have a great way to say, look, at this phase, do it, you know, in phase two, and it got a little messy. Whereas if we had a shared uh, model that we could sort of look at, we could say, okay, here's phase two, here's the flow, here's where this decision should be made or shouldn't be made. Um, so that's where I think this fits better. I hope that answers the question. Um, yeah, it, it isn't, uh, it, yeah, so that's where I would start. I would, I, I would probably, and that's why you model an existing one. I'm not, if you really wanted to model from the ground up, you could, but it seems to me that I would find it personally, if, someone's, if I was doing game design, to sit down here and do this first, I think is a little odd especially because of how we approach game design. So again, probably better as an analysis collaborative and, and a classroom tool. I think classrooms could find it useful for students to be able to explain their design and be able to maybe say, where's the, where's the, uh, the main flow? Where's the central core loop? Where does the, 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 the biggest decisions become made? What decisions are superfluous? All those types of things could be made more useful uh, in, this type of, in this type of language. So that was the intent there. Okay, there are no further questions. We've got about, it looks like about 10, 15 minutes left. Um, I haven't got my, I'll show you a few other things just briefly. So this is, this is the tool. Uh, like I said, if anyone is JavaScript developer and wants to give me two cents on this, I'm happy to take it. Um, I've, 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 I've included, if you choose to use the tool, you're welcome to use it. It's uh, open source, uh, freely available on my website. I'll show you exactly how to get to it in a minute. Um, actually, I think the website address should be available. Um, so that should be less of an issue. Let me, I'm clicking around here. Uh, Lucas, I think, will post it. Um, but in the meantime, so the, I have included these as more icons. Oh, there's one here, for example, that, that I didn't show you called Other Player, and this is where you can say someone else other than the active player. So if it's my turn and anyone else can do a thing, we might want to give them a domain to say Other Player. So there is variance here. There's room to, room to grow. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for the, the, the chat. I'm actually going to save, try to save the chat when we're done here. And I'll just I'll keep that as a record because some of this stuff is going to, I don't want to add too much. I'll be honest. I, I, I kind of want to keep this down to a dozen icons or so because it, if the bigger it grows, the harder it gets to use. And I want people to be able to use it. I, I don't want anyone to have to do more than what I just showed you to get started. I don't want there to be, you know, two years of, of training to, to model something. I don't think that's not, I don't think that's what we need at this point. Um, so yeah, I might add a couple more icons. I'm trying to make everything fit in what we have. There's a couple of things I've added to the software. If you choose to use it, there's also little fun icons. You can add people like to decorate their, their diagrams. Um, so a couple of little things while we're here, while I got a couple minutes to wrap up. Oh, that's not it. Um, this was supposed to work. Uh, you cannot tab out of it. Okay. We will do it. Give me a second. What does that do? Oh, that does this. Okay, there we are. Okay, so we can just walk through this briefly through my website here. So uh, all of this is linked on my website. So, um, which I, again, I think Lucas is sharing the web address, um, but I'll put it on the screen as well. So 
Uh, I've got a little overview here for anyone who wants to get started. If you want to watch on your own, there is a video here you can watch. I'm not going to play it for you because it's just more of me talking and you don't need that at this point. You've had an hour. I think that's enough. Uh, and the video here is it was adapted from the last time I gave this presentation. The last time I talked about this, it was all PowerPoint. Uh, it turned out to be I recorded it and it was an, it was just an awful recording. So I redid it and made a nice little PowerPoint here. So there's that um, a video here you can watch about a 10 minute tool, 10, 12 minutes. Uh, there's also the link to the tools. So you can try that directly. Um, there is a little bit of a explanation of each to, of each icon. So as this is, it's not uh, not the most in depth. But part of me is again trying to keep it open. I don't want to run down too much. Into, I don't want to get too much into the weeds of exactly how it must be used, and I don't want to get too abstracted, where where it becomes everything does everything because that doesn't help either. So that's here available as well for anyone who's interested. There's also if you are modeling with this please let me know share me share the share what you do with me because i am adding them to this ongoing gallery here i've got some things here i mean some of my designs but i've also got some things by other designers on here and i'm happy to add your design to the gallery i'd love to flesh this out and have samples that other people can look at when they're building their design and say hey how did someone else handle this problem or this one here by the way this might actually help uh answer an earlier question um this is alan and he uh he has a um, a D and D based game. I'm not sure the whole game, but he what he did is he uh, started with an like a, a high level model, but he's also got a more in depth version of the same thing. So he said, "Look, if I just want to talk about a high level, he's got hero phase, exploration phase, and villain phase." But he said, "Okay, that's something, but you know what? Let me explain in depth what they mean." And that's how he chose to model. I think that's a fantastic solution. Okay, to an earlier question about how how deep do we go. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of different ways you can handle it. And again, I'd like to try to build this out. So as you go, if you say, Hey, I've used the tool, uh, feel free to grab a screenshot of it. It should save to your hard drive right now. It hasn't got a lot of saving options because I had to disable them because, uh, they weren't working, but, uh, I'm working on fixing those. So yeah, so I can definitely grab screenshots. There's another one here. This is, uh, Peter Hayward's, uh, scuttle. He added this one. So as you think of more things, uh, if you want to, I'm happy to add them to the to the light to the gallery here, and then I link back to your social or your website or whatever you like as well. Uh, you so that's one last question. Yes, last question. Yeah. I was say, we have so, any more? Fantastic. Yes. Um. So you're. It looks like so you're using Draw.io here or whatever it's been renamed yes. to. Yes. Just wondering, comparing Draw.io to other similar flow chart or map ma ma uh, mind map programs or to physical things like using post-it notes and string, for example, like what yeah. is the pros and cons to those different tools? Okay, so, I mean, look, again, whatever tool you use to design that works for you, it works for you. I'm not here to replace or, or supplant that. This is just an, anal an, an analysis tool. It's one more tool in the toolbox. Um, the other modeling tools, the reason I went with Draw.io is simple. It's very, it, was just, it was a very simple decision for me. It was open source, so I could edit it without too much headache. Um, and so is that everything it's based on is open source, so it was easy to get access to. It doesn't have a, you know, not a ton of documentation, but it, it was easy enough for me to get into it and make it available on my own server and modify it and not have to worry too much about any of the other issues that come around with it. Uh, and because it's also on the web, it's accessible to anyone. And that was another intent as well. Okay, I, I want this to be, anything else I looked at for me that I was like, wait, I'll add tools to this application or Visio or whatever and build a library for this. Firstly, you have, that, that means that I need, that means you would need that application, which I can't rely on. And then I've got to go build a thing and do a tutorial on how to install it. And it was, it added layers that I just didn't want to go near. Um, it's not to say draw.io is better or worse. For this purpose, I think it's fine. Um, it, you know, every tool is a matter of, a lot in every tool, not every tool, but a lot of tools are a matter of preference. So if you find something you prefer, if you have another tool that you think a lot of people use that you think I should look into, let me know. If it's like, oh no, Mark, everyone's really using this other tool. And if we can find a way to build a module for it or adapt it, I'm happy to look into that. Uh, like I said, for me, it was the easiest first entry point for me to design a tool. If you like working on post-it notes, and you find that flows better on a, on a, on a wall, then go for it. Like I said, one of my games is it became a class diagram for anyone who's familiar with that um, because it just had, I had like a hundred cards that were all interacting with each other in different ways. And I was like, I don't know how to, the, the, this, you know, that was the tool that made the most sense there. So if you have a tool that works that, that is better, uh, then go for it. 
Um, the other tools don't offer, like the one thing that I did need when I was designing this is I needed a way to build my own library of tools. Um, some of them are similar, like the actor from UML, you could use a stick figure. A lot of software tools have a stick figure, um, but they don't all have the pie slice and they don't have that little twist to change turn orders. And you could do it. You're going to just have to spend time in other tools customizing them. And then you'd have to go to one library to get the actor and another library to get the decision diamond. And it, it got messy. So that was why I went with this tool. But it's a good question. Okay, any other questions as we wrap up? Last five minutes. Doesn't look at, like any for now, but we can wait a moment for the chat. Uh, chat. In the meantime, do you want to reintroduce yourself and just, you know, who you are, where people can find you? Sure. I, I guess it's, ex is it, it's no longer introduce, it's extraduce. Ex is extraduce a word? <laughs> we should make it a word. Extraduce myself. Uh, say, say hi as I'm leaving. Oh, this was me mucking about with things. Hold on. Uh, let's go back somewhere. Okay, well, we'll just delete all this. Uh, so, uh, yeah, on the screen, I'll put this all on the screen because then I uh, don't have to repeat myself too much. Um, okay, so what do you need to know? My name is Mark, oh, not spelled correctly, Mark Gerwitz. Uh, <clears throat> how can you find me? Is this, this is legible, I think? This should be good screen size. It will also be in the Twitch chat. It'll be in the Twitch chat as well. Okay, so. Okay, and because I have color, I'm going to use it. Okay. Uh, so there's my name. Uh, da, 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 what do you need to know? Email mark at g-wiz.ca, which is also the website. Website g-wiz.ca slash agml. It goes straight to the agml. The rest of my websites, other things. Um, and I'm on Twitter. Um, Twitter. And uh, do we write Twitter anymore? Or we just write T. I don't know what we do. I, I'm often an app symbol, but all right. Oh, right. But the app also means Instagram. I'm not on Instagram. Uh, right. <laughs> so that's why I'm, I'm, anyways, for some reason it didn't color. Uh, there we are. Let's do it again. There we are. Okay. Uh, so a T there. So no, it's Twitter, not Instagram. Anyways, there you go. That's my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to discuss more. I'm happy to share. I'm happy to take ideas. And if you think we should add something, if something doesn't work in the app, let me know. I can try to fix it. I've had a few, a few minor hiccups and glitches here and there. So I'm happy to go back and look at those. Um, that, I don't know what else to say. I think that's it. So I want to thank you all for your time. I do really appreciate you coming out and spending your hour with me this morning slash afternoon. We went from one to the other and skipping your lunch to uh, to get your questions asked and hopefully answered. So thank you very much. I really appreciate that. There's been some great chat and some great points as we went through. So I, I, that's all fantastic. Uh, again, any more questions as we go through, please feel free to reach out. My name is Mark. Thank you very much for your time. Have yourselves a pleasant and wonderful afternoon and rest of your day. Thank you for your time as well. Thanks. And thank you to Lucas, who's been facilitating all the questions as we've gone through, and Andy, who's silent on the other end, making sure that all the technical com technical elements continue to work. And I don't think we've had any glitches, and it is all due to Andy's wonderful work and Lucas's fantastic job uh, mediating. Thank you. Do I log off? Do I sit here until everyone's left?